right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our CCDE uh, webinar for the day. Uh, my name is Matt Saunders, um, Community Manager over on the Cisco Learning Network, and I will be your host and moderator of the session today. Um, we'd love to hear from you as you as we get started. So um, please, if you take a, could take a moment and just drop a note in the chat to let us know where in the world you're joining from. That'd be greatly appreciated. We'd love to see everyone's names pop up with all the locations that they're joining from. And I will also launch a very brief poll question here once I finish with a couple little notes, um, just a little gauge to see where folks are at in their certification studies. And thank you everyone for dropping those notes in there. Um, lots of Ireland, Switzerland, Florida, Phoenix. Awesome. So happy to see everybody. Um, we have a great panel today, a great session planned. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, the recording of the session will be made available afterwards, and a follow-up email will be sent to all of the attendees with information on how to access the recording. Typically, that takes about three to five business days, so please do look for this follow-up email sometime into next week with all of the key information that's needed. Um, after the session, We'll, we'll direct everybody to a open discussion thread over on the Cisco Learning Network uh, CCDE forum for follow-up Q&A after the session, um, as well as information on where that recording is. However, we're also happy to take Q&A uh, questions throughout the presentation um, in written form, and we just ask that you use the Q&A panel as much as possible to submit those questions as opposed to the chat window. Just helps to make the man uh, managing the flow of those questions a bit easier for the panelists. Um, and then we'll also save some time at the end of the session for some verbal Q&A with the uh, presenters for the day as well. Um, so let's see, I think those are my housekeeping. Oh, and if you happen to experience any audio streaming issues throughout the session today, I'll be sure to repost the toll-free call-in number um, sometimes if audio streaming gets a little funky, uh, using the dial-in number typically resolves any, any issues with that, um, with audio streaming. So I'll, I'll be sure to share that information here shortly as well. And with that, it's my privilege to introduce our speakers for the day. For the day. Um, first up, we will have CCDE Program Manager Mark Holm, who will be helping to lead the discussion today and sharing his insights on how to prepare for the CCDE exam as well as some key information on the certification program uh, roadmaps that we've recently begun to publish for uh, visibility into updates to exams and such. And so Mark will cover that information at the beginning. And then from there, we'll have both Zig Zigza, Ziga and Martin Duggan, who are both uh, CCDE certified principal network architects and Cisco Press authors. And they'll really be dig uh, digging into uh, preparation best practices and tips for success with the CCDE certification, as well as sharing a bit of details on the upcoming study guide from Zig himself uh, published uh, through Cisco Press for the CCDE exam. So really looking forward to all of that. And also um, want to mention, be sure to stay tuned to the end of the session uh, for information on a, uh, a pretty significant discount code offering from Cisco Press. Um, you can use that for uh, Zig's upcoming book, or you can also use that for any other courseware that Cisco Press author uh, Cisco Press offers. And we'll have a slide at the end with all of that detail, as well as some follow-up communications after the session. All righty, and with that, um, Mark, I think uh, we should make sure that you've got the ball here and let you take it away. Let me make sure you have the presenter role, and then let's jump right in. All right, thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Um, I'm happy that we've been able to get both Sig and Martin on the, on the webinar. It's going to be lots of fun. It's going to be lots of interesting talks. I'm sure of that. Um, but I just want to start out with some a bit of updates from, from my end, from the certification side. Um, that also means, as Matt mentioned about the uh, recently announced certification roadmaps that we're going to introduce for virtually any certification that we have. And that includes the CC. I'm just going to talk a bit about how that impacts you and how you should react. Um, not that any changes are imminent, but I'll get back to that. But just keep a note of there will be coming changes to the CCD program as well as part of this new uh, roadmap. 
So yeah, but quick view here. We've kind of done the introductions already. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into the CCD status. Um, as you may know, we updated the CCD, made a major revision back in November 2021. So we just celebrated our first anniversary, um, which I'm happy to say it's been a great year. And it's been a, a year that has seen us getting super feedback from, from those who've taken the exam. Um, which means anything from the content, but also from the, the exam engine that we now offer internally. As you may know, we used to hold the exam in Pearson View locations, but now it's moved to our usual certification uh, center. So it's the same place as you take your CCIE lab exams. Um, reception has been really good. We get the feedback that it's a nice engine. It's good to work with and it's easy to work with as well, which is of course a, a very important part of it. And of course, the move in-house was a decision that we made relatively early in the process, moving from version two to version three. And it's been a, yeah, it's been a success on all cases. We've had no, virtually no issues with delivering the exams. Um, we have to been able to deliver our results within 24 hours in most cases, and often even faster. In some cases, we're down to talking maybe three, four, five hours after you finish the exam, you have the results in, which is a, uh, Got to say, it's a pretty significant increase or short shortening of the um, of the waiting time compared to the OV2, where you had to wait up to 12 weeks to get your results. So we're super nice to be able to give you your results so quickly, so you know whether you need to reschedule or reassess whatever you need to do, and just get on instead of waiting 10 to 12 weeks before you even know whether you need to prepare for another attempt or need to go back to study or whatever it is. As part of it, we want the feedback, or I want the feedback to be to be honest. Don't be shy. If, if you ha if you take your exam, whether it's a written or a practical, you can always submit feedback during the exam. There's a comment field that you can type in anything. It will be read. I will read those comments and I will react to them if, if needed. So don't be afraid to, to write comments. In case you don't want to spend time doing your exam to, to do this, you can always opt to go for it when you go back home. You can open a case with learning and certification support, and you're allowed to discuss the content there so you can give feedback on specific items or specific parts of the exam that you did or did not like. It's positive and negative feedback, everything is good. So don't be shy. I'll be happy to read it because that's the only way we can improve the exam for, for everybody. And that's that, just a status here that says that we have no current plan changes um to current technologies or the blueprint but if you haven't noticed or haven't heard what we recently did was we introduced what we call the certification life cycle management which essentially means that we're going to switch to a much much more agile revision of our exams um, so essentially we will be evaluating every year we'll be evaluating the current exam topics the um and the for the ccd the, the technology list we'll be reviewing those and we'll be doing that on a cadence-based approach. So we can do it every year around the same time. That means hopefully that the idea is that you can count more and when you can expect announced to come out about any updates you need to be aware of, like changes to the blueprint, the topics, the technologies, whatever it is. That's what we want to do and make it easier for you to be able to plan your study and preparation for the exam. Um, and this simply means that we will be doing this for the DE. It's going to be around, roughly around October, November timeframe every year, because we're going to use, just happen to use the, the, the anniversary date of the CCD V3. That means that we will announce, at one quarter, we will announce that there will be an, uh, you know, an updated exam. And then you'll have a period of time before we actually put it into production. So, what we'll do is in the we reach October November timeframe, we'll review whatever there is, work with it, assess whether we need to do anything about the current exam and the state it's in. Then we'll work on updating all the documents. We will work on building release notes. You can see the exact difference between the current and the upcoming version of the exam. And then once, once we finalize that, we'll announce them. And as we usually do with expert level certification, we will give you six months of notification before we actually do the switchover. 
So it should leave you with ample time to assess whether you need to stay, you want to stay with the current or you want to go for the, the upcoming changes of the exam. Um, and I mentioned this is going to be every year uh, around the same time. Um, so this is probably you can expect announcements to be made, you know, around December, January, if anything's going to come up. And the current plan is that we will have an update revision to the CCD program in what we call fourth quarter of fiscal year 24. Uh, for those of you who don't know Cisco's fiscal year calendar, it means that it will be sometime in between May and July of 2024. So no changes are planned for the entire 2023 and the first half of, of roughly the first half of 2024. So no changes are coming. So if you're on your path to studying, keep on doing it uh, because there's no, there's not going to be any unpleasant surprises if when we do any switchover um, in, in, in the near future. And this means, as you can see in the past, we just give a little more detail on this. What we do is we will have in the past, we did more like major revisions with 2.1 to 3.0, and it came like like a big surprise to everybody, and everybody was like, oh, I can't take the exam now, and I, I need to wait. So this is what we do, and we did not have any cadence planned out for it. That's what we're going to do now. It's going to be my, minor revisions, and we're going to do those every year by, by default. But that said, when we do the review, one result review can easily be that we do not make any changes, and then we won't make any announcements. So if you don't hear anything, you, you can assume that's no plan changes are, are going to come anytime soon until the next um, iteration cycle, so to speak. But it will be what we call, the minor reason will be what we call small changes. And that is defined as up to 20% of the current exam blueprint, exam topics and, and technology list. So it won't be a massive overhaul, it will be something like we added some technologies, we add a few topics to the exam topics list, it, whatever it might be, but it's not going to be more than 20% based on the current version. So you can still use the same basis to prepare. You just need maybe to look at some new technologies or look at things from a different perspective, from a design perspective. Um, and hopefully this allows you to plan your studying. That's the intent of it, is make it easier to you be able to, to study and plan for it. The idea is also that we uh, will align it to other tracks. So let's say associated professional level exams, we'll do whatever we can to, to align them with other relevant tracks and, and certifications, just to make sure that we have a, you know, a, a good line here from, from associate to expert level exams. Um, it doesn't mean that even though it, if the professional gets changed, let's take the CCMP design related exams gets changed, it doesn't mean that we will necessarily use the D immediately because it's more complex due to the way we deliver the exam and, and the scenario based exam. So it's a little more complicated, but we will do our best to make sure it's aligned all the way up to make it easier for you to, to see the idea of the uh, certification program. So this one kind of sums it up. This is based on, on primary written based with the CCIE in mind. But as you can see, this is pretty much showing that we'll do this every year. It's going to be minor revision primarily. Of course, if there's a major revision at some point, that would be made with a little more, you know, bigger impact announcement, so to speak. But 20% max. And the, the topology change, software change, obviously doesn't apply to the CCD because we don't deal with this. And of course, also the, the hardware equipment and model change doesn't apply to us really. But what applies here is that we give you six months of notice for any changes that we do whether it's uh, my minor or major. So what we can change is, as I mentioned, just sort of summing it up, blue conversion number will be incremented. So it could be 3.1 to 3.2 instead of 1.1, .1, which is just for an example. We use up to 20%. And if it's relevant, we'll update software versions for Cisco products. But again, this is for primarily for the CCIE. But we're not changing the exam number, so it's still going to be 400-007 to book the exam. Still going to get you six months in the expert level notifications. And basically, that's what the certification roadmap will mean for the CCD, is that we will work to this to make sure that we align this with trends in the industry, with new technologies that becomes relevant, 
much, much faster than we have been able to do in the past, but it could take several years, to be honest, before we were even close to, um, to this. So, um, but that said, that's pretty much actually what I wanted to say here. Um, the idea is actually that I will pass it on to Zick so he can talk about the CCD written and how his new exciting book is going to be uh, published soon. So, uh, Matt, can you pass the ball? Because I can't figure it out to do it, to be honest. I got it, Mark. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for everyone for joining. Um, for those that don't know who I am, um, I see a lot of familiar faces, not faces, but names in the chat, uh, in the panel, uh, in the attendees list as well. Uh, so for those of the people that I do know and know me, welcome. Good to see you again. Good to have you here. And for those that, um, you know, we're meeting for the first time, well, here's a little bit about me. Um, I'm Zig Ziga. I'm a principal architect in, in Cisco Systems. Um, I, I support the U.S. public sector CX organization. Uh, I gained my CCD in 2016, so a few years ago. Uh, and just to really raw about my experience, I failed the exam three times, and then I passed it the final time, the fourth time. So I didn't pass it the first time or the second time or the third time. Every time was a learning experience for me. As Mark and Matt said, I'm the author of the CCD V3 Official Certification Guide, which is really going to be tailored towards the written exam and then foundational information that you will need to take further into Martin's book and, and, and the actual CCD practical exam. This book is not released yet. I got to be fully transparent, and it, it won't be released until sometime in Q2 of 2023. When we do know an official date, we will let everyone know as soon as we, we have that information. The most important thing I feel like on this on this slide is network design and the CCD changed my life. Um, it really just changed my life. And I'll go into this. I have a quote that I, I created so everyone can see this. So network design changed my career. And I think a lot of you that are on this call and are going to hear about network design and the CCD are going to resonate that, okay, yes, it's going to change your career. But if you take that one step forward, more importantly, it's going to change your life. It changed my life and how I think about everything. Total mindset shift. All right. So what was I doing wrong? All right. And maybe some of this is going to resonate for some of you. I want to be really clear. These are all the things I was doing wrong when I was going after the CCD and before the CCD, before I was even aware of network design. I was making networks without truly understanding why I was doing so. I was just making them because that's what I was told to do. I was not understanding every single design decision I was making. So I'll give an example, a real world example. I like EIGRP. So every situation, routing situation with IGP, I would select EIGRP because I was like, I like this. I know it. That's not truly understanding every design decision. I was making bad network designs, truly. My focus was on the CLI, the commands, the protocols, not on network design. And a lot of times I used because it's best practice to justify my design choices. I used this for 10, 15 years in this career, in this industry. My mindset was wrong. I lost, a, what, I lost sight of what truly, really matters, and that's the why. And if anything else you take out of here today, the why is what matters. When you're going after the CCD or network design, you have to understand why you are doing what you're doing. All right. Hopefully I, I hammered that home. So real quick, what is the CCDE, right? So we had the poll. A lot of you don't even know what the CCD is, right? So let's, let's kind of level set real quick. Uh, Cisco Certified Design Expert Certification. Uh, you need to be able to compare the technologies and architectures. You need to be able to bridge the gap between the technology, what we care about like from a technical perspective, and the business side of things. You are that middle ground. You are literally bridging that gap. Um, you have to understand which option is better and why. So again, back to that, that IGP situation or example, why is EIGRP better than OSPF? Why is OSPF better than EIGRP? If you can't answer that simple question, then you have to go back to the, to the books, back to the drawing board, and really figure out why are they better in different situations from a design perspective. Now, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harp on mindset. This is truly a mindset, a mindset shift. We've never been taught this. 
Uh, we're not taught this. We're taught to go play with the protocols. Go get your CCNA and, and you know, learn about routing and switching and, and go deploy, you know, a spanning tree and go deploy a routing protocol. But we're not really truly taught network design mindset. And that's what I like to call it. It's a network design mindset. And the last bullet here, because a lot of people like to compare what's different between the CCDE and, and the CCIE. And this, this simple sentence is, the CCI is the how you do something, and the CCD is the why you do it, right? So why is there again? You're going to see it throughout this entire presentation and all your, your network design and CCD experiences. Real quick, just so you guys have an understanding of how to obtain the CCD V3 certification, the first step is taking the written exam, which is what my book is tailored for. That's the 400-007. Now, there's a marketing thing here. That's 007, get your license to design, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, once you pass that, which I did not pass my first time, I actually failed the first time and then passed the second time. And honestly, it was the best written exam I ever took, just so I'm being really honest. Even though I failed it that first time, it was obvious. I just didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, but once you pass it, then you can actually schedule the practical exam. And, and we'll get into the detail if you have questions. That's what Martin's book is fully available to cover today on um is that the, the practical exam and, and, and how to you know ta tackle the different scenarios that you're going to have once you pass that then you are a cisco certified design expert hopefully that makes sense hopefully i didn't oversimplify that for everyone all right so some some recommendations from my perspective all right a cci is not required all right it is not required or or a prerequisite and in my experience it actually was a hindrance um, I was too tactical in my mindset and I was making bad design decisions and it was hindering me for passing the, the CCD exam. All right. You're not going to have any configurations that you need to test on. You're not going to be in the CLI, you know, typing your configurations. You, there's none of that in this exam. Um, you're going to have to analyze and translate the business requirements into solutions. Again, you need to be able to speak the business language which I think Martin's going to get into in a little bit, some of those examples. And you need to be able to speak the technical language and combine them together. Um, knowing how things work is good in the field. I do recommend if you're having a hard time understanding something complex, go ahead and lab it out. Um, but don't, don't, don't spend too much time labbing it out. You have to understand that technology, that protocol, to an, a point where you can make a decision from a design perspective on it. You don't need to know how to implement it in a eight hour lab exam. That's not what you're doing. Uh, the recommended is five to seven years of relevant job experience. Um, I think it just kind of fluctuate. Do you know all the protocols, all the technologies, and can you compare them from a design perspective? You got to keep it high level. There's no device specific details required. So it's not like we're talking about um, data sheets on a specific product. But what we are doing is a high level classification of the devices. So is this a firewall? Is this a next gen firewall? Is it a router, a switch, a load balancer? They have different capabilities and you need to be able to identify where they need to kind of fit in, in the architecture or the design. Um, now this last bullet is more for the, the actual practical exam. I do recommend when you're ready for that, practice full length scenarios. And I say practice it like it's the real deal. Set up four scenarios in an eight hour time block and run through them back to back because there's nothing like doing um, the real exam uh, unless you do something like that, in my opinion. Um, take time to analyze the current environment, right? E even on the written, you're going to get a whole bunch of information. Analyze the information. Um, don't make assumptions on what you're not seeing or what you aren't, you know, what you're expecting to see. Uh, all necessary information is provided. So don't come in to either exam and, and have your outside information. I like to call those preconceived notions. So don't come in with a preconceived notion that um, EIGRP is better than OSPF always. Like that's kind of a preconceived notion, right? Don't make those, those assumptions or those preconceived notions. Um, make fact-based decisions. And don't spend time visualizing configurations. Again, you are not configuring anything in this exam, in either exam, the written or the practical. So what's next? I'm going real quick because I want you guys to have time to ask your questions. That's really what we're focusing on here. But I want to be very clear that the CCD is a challenging certification because it really is a different mindset. It's a different way of thinking, right? So we're not taught that, like I said at the beginning. 
Um, but it is a good challenge. It, it helps you in your career and, and, honestly, and honestly in your life. Um, it does require understanding the business, right? So I keep harping that. You need to understand the business. You need to extend your mindset and your skill set. And again, this is this is your chance to get your license design. All right, this is your serious chance to get it. All right, some other resources here. Uh, the Cisco Learning Network has a whole bunch of material. Mark and the team have put together a learning matrix, which is outstanding. Uh, an Excel document, for lack of a better word, that has all kind of the blueprint items or, or technology area of expertise items listed out and kind of what other resources for you to, to learn that thing. Is it a Cisco Live deck? Is it a, a Cisco Press book? You name it, a good good resource for you to have. Um, ask questions, don't be shy. This community is really tight knit. So if you have questions, ask. Make sure they're the relevant questions and we won't break NDA. But outside of that, ask your questions. Um, use study groups. Very helpful. Uh, what you see on a day-to-day -day basis might be very different than someone else in a different country seeing things on a day-to-day -day basis. There's different perspectives, you name it. Um, and team up with others, right? Team up with others. That's how that's how I was helpful, uh, you know, hearing that. I think this is one of my last slides. So for those that don't know, I have my own brand, my own website, zigbits.tech, and it's really focused on network design and, and, and also by, by association to CCDE. So I have a network design podcast that you can go listen to. I have design articles you can read, uh, a Discord community um, with a whole bunch of people in there helping out as they can, an email list, YouTube videos, you name it, we have it there. You're not required to go there, but it's a, it's a resource for you to have. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martin to talk about the CCD practical. Martin, you got it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was very good. <laughs> I learned a few things. Uh, so hi, I'm Martin. I gained my D in 2016, which is the same as Zig and Mark as well, actually, those numbers. I'm the author of the CCI and CCD Practice Lab series for Cisco Press. It's fortunate enough to be the uh, tech review of Zig Study Guide as well, so I've read it. It's actually very good, so I recommend that. And I'm a network architect. Now, interestingly enough, that was before and after the DE exam. I also create content for multiple exam tracks from CCNA right up to CCIE, and I was involved in the V3 update recently for this exam. So in terms of the approach, I think the first thing you actually have to ask yourself, is this actually for me? So it's time to be honest with yourself. You know, this actually isn't for everybody. So unless you've got that five to seven type years experience on the job, you're going to find this very challenging. It is a tough exam. So I generally tell people that you actually already need to be operating as a DE prior to, prior to gaining the qualification. So you're kind of working with CTOs, you're working with other architects directly with a the customer, then you're working with engineers. You're kind of going between the business side and the, and the technical side. You're working with OPEX and CAPEX constantly. So if OPEX and CAPEX are not your thing, for example, then you may find that you're better suited to CCI type track, but hopefully you are suited to this one. So, as Zig's already mentioned, this is all about focusing on the why and not the how. So that is the actual fundamental difference between an IE and a DE. So it's like knowing why you'd use that and when you'd use that specific technology. So going back to OSPF and ERGRP again, you know, it's not to say one's better than the other, but when you're faced with sort of specific requirements and constraints in the exam condition, you know, one of those routing protocols would be optimal to use in that, in that area. Study groups, Six mentioned study groups, they are extremely important. You know, I had a really good one, had all the big names in my one, I was very fortunate. Um, I'd encourage you to join a group. If you can't find one, set one up yourself. I'm sure you'll find others will follow. So I'd urge you again to actually lead an area of discussion in your expertise. Others will do the same and you're all gonna benefit from that. It's also a great place to work on the practice labs. You can get together and review the answers. Um, some of your sort of Study group members may have already taken the exam, so obviously NDA is extremely important. You can't discuss the exam. Cisco Life, so we've got Amsterdam coming up next month. If you're lucky enough to go, then I'd uh, I'd say that Mark's DE tutorials is an absolute must. You know, you're going to get to actually take an exam and analyze every question step by step, find out what they were actually after. It's it's just fantastic. Um, I'd also recommend you get to some design sessions. Um, look at your areas of weakness as well. So, you know, IPv6 and multicast for me were the ones. 
and you can actually meet the engineer as well. So the DE team will be available. You can book up Mark's time and sit down with him and discuss, you know, how, how your study is going up to now, get some pointers really. And also a good opportunity, obviously, to network and uh, hopefully you can meet some of your study group. CCDE.blog is a website that I've created fairly recently, a bit like Ziggs. Um, got lots of hints and tips there. I break out the technology lists, uh, created a reading list as well. And I'm just adding kind of uh, DE journeys to this as well. So if you're, if you're successful, get in touch and we can put you on there as well. So lots of resources, feel free to use them. Uh, in terms of lessons learned, you've got to remember it's a journey for your family too. So they really need to understand that commitment that you're putting in. It's a big commitment from them as well. So you need to be aligned. If you're going in different directions, it's going to be very hard to be successful in the exam. So it's very important. Uh, if you can't explain the tech to a non-technical person, then you probably don't understand it yourself. So this could be a good chance to get maybe a child or a friend, pick an area from the technology list, try and explain what that actually is in, in sort of kind of a layman's term. And if you're struggling to do that, then you probably don't know that tech and it's time to go back, invest a little bit more time in that. Okay. If you go into the lab as a CCIE, then you're probably going to leave as a CCIE. So we discuss this all the time with with IEs and DEs, but you know the IEs really going to be looking at the low level. They're going to be overanalyzing everything. They're not. They're going to be looking at best practice. You need to kind of take a step back from that. Got to remember this is an architecture exam. You're not making any assumptions. You're just making informed decision. All the information is there for you. So it's architect versus engineer. Choosing the correct answer is going to help. So it might sound a little bit strange, but when you're in the exam, you're going to be presented with what looks like five perfectly good answers. So if the, the correct answer is not jumping out at you, then you've definitely missed something. Okay. So it's a case of going back to the background documentation, going through all of the constraints and requirements, and they should lead you to an answer. So with that, you should be able to validate your correct answer. If you're doing an IE exam, it's generally a lot easier to validate because it's configure X to do Y and you can actually test it. But here you've got to validate it based on the requirements. Okay. And then reduce the stress. So I'd say, you know, if that test center is more than an hour away, then get yourself in the hotel. Uh, you don't want to be arriving late because of traffic in the morning. Okay. If you're traveling internationally, then don't get the last flight in. Give yourself plenty of options. And then no last minute study. Okay. So this is not a memory exam. So it's time to just relax, be calm for the, for the big, and lab ahead of you. And also give yourself a break leading, leading on from that. So we all know that studying can be pretty intensive. So I might do a two hour or four hour study and then I'd go out and I'd cycle. And for me, that was just fantastic. It would give me a chance to unwind. It would let me absorb all that information. And I think it's really useful to do something that you really love in between sessions. And then finally for me, so what if I fail? Now, importantly, what you've got to remember is you've only failed if you actually do give up and walk away from this. As Zig said, it's taken a couple of attempts. You know, me too. It's very tough, but it's, it is achievable and it's very worthwhile. So if you're not successful, then you'll get a score. Okay, If you are successful, you won't get a score. But if you aren't, you're going to get this score and you can actually have a look at it. You can evaluate your areas of weakness. So you're going to have to come up with a plan. It doesn't mean just taking the next iteration of the exam, maybe three months time. It could mean another year. It could mean working on specific projects where you're weak. It could mean more, much more time with your study group. So that could be a year. But if you do fail, I recommend you come back fighting because it's definitely worth it. So that was my last slide. So Matt, back to you. And I think we can probably take some questions, I guess. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Martin, uh, Zig and Mark. And uh, we got some really good questions that came in. Um, so first of all, what I'm going to do is just steal the ball back and I will advance to the Cisco Press um, uh, uh, discount details slide. Now this information will also be made available in uh, follow-up email communications to all of the webinar attendees and folks that registered as well. But um, just for FYI now, if you want to write this code down, it's good for 45% on books, 55% on ebooks, and 70% on video courses across the Cisco Press website. Of course, we recommend uh, 
you know, using that code for the new book when it comes out uh, in uh, the second quarter here, coming soon. So um, if you want to jot that down now, great. Otherwise, we'll uh, share that via email afterwards as well. And then, yeah, we got some great questions. Mark, I'd like to start with you. There were a couple of folks that asked about the uh, cadence for delivering the exams for, for candidates to be able to sit for the exams. Um, I think uh, six month uh, frequency was mentioned currently. And there's a curiosity if there's any, inter any um, plans to increase the frequency of the exam deliveries. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm assuming by exam, I, I assume we talk about the practical exam here, which is at this point in time, it offered roughly every two months. Um, so six times a year. Um, we're constantly looking at demand essentially to see if we need to increase the uh, the volume or, the, the, or shorten the period between any exams that we that we have. So at this point in time, we, we don't see any reason to to switch to a quicker cadence to so say every month. Um, but I can probably tell you that much if. I don't see that we will ever switch to, let's say, a CCIE lab model, but we'll do it on a daily basis um, because it's there's some issues by doing that. So I think if I have to guess, the short that we might see in the future is probably going to be once a month. But right now we're going to stick with, with two months and then we'll evaluate, um, let's say, on, a, on an ongoing basis to see if there's a volume issue. Do we have enough seeds? Do we have enough capacity? Do we have it in the right places? Um, so what we have done actually since the launch of E3 is also not only in this, the usual brick and mortar labs that we have, we've also expanded it to certain locations worldwide. Um, and I think we currently have probably four or five places that we do it on a regular basis besides of the regular residence of that's Brussels in Europe, that's Richardson in the US, it's Sydney in Australia, and Bangalore, India, and Tokyo, Japan, and Shanghai or Beijing in China. I can't remember all the locations that we have. But we always open to see if, if there's space is for more locations. So not only do we look at the um, the cadence, but we also look at the locations because we still realize that for some, we still might have some COVID related uh, traveling restrictions to some people or company policies or whatever it might be. So we're also looking at expanding the reach so we're getting closer to, to you as the, uh, the, the community. Um, and again, we, we always, if you have believe there's a place we should have it, we always open to, to hear from you if you want to say, hey, we need it in, I don't know, Johannesburg in South Africa. We'll, we're open to looking into the feasibility of doing so. So again, that's part of the, the feedback I want. Let me know if you believe we need more locations to be able to take the exam. Thank you, Mark. No, I think that uh, helps clarify and answer the question. Um, so for the folks that asked that question, if you have uh, further follow-up, please uh, feel free to add that to the Q&A. Um, otherwise, we'll kind of keep rolling along here a little bit. Zig, for yourself, um, there is a request to do live lessons videos after the book. Uh, and do you have anything like that currently planned? Um, uh, so uh, at the, the cost of potentially put myself out there, we just started talking about that last week. I don't know if it'll actually happen. So just so I'm being transparent, there's no agreed thing that's going to happen today. Um, but I do think there's a lot of value in that moving forward. Um, so, you know, if someone else is on that same thought process, you know, that'd be valuable to have some video um, live lessons around, you know, network design and the CCDE. Um, hopefully that answers your question. I know it, it may not be what you're looking to hear, um, but we are talking about it. And, it. and if we do decide to do it, I'm sure we'll let everyone know. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Zig. Um, and then a couple of questions that kind of dig, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of dig in uh, a little bit deep on you know, the exams themselves. And so I know we'll need to be a little bit mindful of, um, for, you know, being wary of staying away from anything that would violate NDA, as folks have mentioned in their questions as well. But um, so I'll start with, um, I think CCDE is about also observing what is requested. So first, Yazan mentions that um, they focus on uh, what 
then based on that option they do the why would you guys mind kind of speaking to that approach and the approach for preparing to tackle the questions in the exams you know starting with the what first or the why first what's your what are your perspectives on that hope the question I'd, makes sense let's say that one zig i maybe i'll start so you finish it I mean, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead okay, thanks. So I'd say the what is your technology list. So that's going to be effectively, you know, some people call it a blueprint. That's going to be your what. And then you're really, really going to drill down on that. And that's when you start evaluating and comparing the technologies. So you really need to understand, you know, OSPF inside out, EIGRP inside out. So then you can actually say why, why you, would it be applicable to choose one of those in a certain question in the scenario within the exam. So I, does that answer your question? Or is there any more to chill down on that in terms of what and why? Uh, yeah, so I'll add a little bit. So, so, and, and this might be more for the practical. Um, I think it's still warranted for the written, but maybe not to the scale. You know, the practical is a reading comprehension exam, right? So you, you're going to have a whole bunch of information that you got to process. So you're going to have what in there, right? And you're going to also have constraints and requirements that you got to dig out. And from all that, you're going you're gonna to choose an answer that, that aligns to the why. Uh, that meets all those things, and I know I'm being vague with things, but it's going to meet the requirements. It's going to meet the constraints. It's going to meet the situation that you're being presented, and, and your answer is going to kind of align to that why. Now, now to Martin's point, um, that question might actually have multiple answers that are correct. So I always tell people, choose the option that you can best defend the why. So if, if the if the question has like routing protocols and there's four different routing protocols and just for simplicity, it's OSPF, EIGRP, um, BGP, and then maybe maybe RIP. Um, and maybe the right two options might be EIGRP and OSPF, let's say. Um, you know, choose which one you can defend why. That That's my, my, my opinion on it. So hopefully that answered the question at hand. Thank you both so much, Mark. Anything you'd like to add, or should we keep going? No, I think uh, Sick and Martin really nailed that one. So uh, let's move on to the next one. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Chris mentioned that, you know, when he reviews the exam topics, he says, "I can do that," but he's a little hesitant to to go and sit for you know pay for the fee for booking the exam, right? Go through the process of doing it, and maybe not succeed. And I know for some of our um, CCIE lab exams, we've been able to offer practice uh, lab environments now. Um, is there any recommendations for how folks might be able to maybe get some practice, tackling some practice questions ahead of time? There is a V3 practical book out there by Cisco Press. So that, that would, I would say go start with the book really. So that's gonna be, you know, the way to actually validate if you're ready to take the practical exam. And as Zig said, whenever you take these practice labs, you take it as if it's under exam conditions, you do them back to back. Can you cope with that kind of stress of doing them in the exam? Um, and really, yeah, you really want to take these practice labs before you go and take the real lab. Because it's, it's, it's a far more cost effective way to do it. And it, it just tells you whether you're ready or not as well. And if you're not ready, it tells you where you need to focus your attention. Martin, do you mind if I add a few things on that one? Of course, yeah. So, so when you practice like it's the real deal, I truly mean practice it like it's the real deal. You're going to have four scenarios. How are you going to take notes? How are you going to highlight information in the text? How are you going to pull out the requirements? And then what's your timeline? Like you're only going to have so much time in each scenario. Uh, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's two hours, right? Um, in each scenario. So you have two hours. How much time are you going to read this scenario? I personally did about 15, 20 minutes. I would read the entire text in the scenario, try to really connect to what's happening before I started answering questions. Um, but you got to figure out how you are going to manage your time because it is a time management exam. You got eight hours to finish the exam. And we're talking about the practical, right? Um, and then how are you going to handle writing all that, all that information down? Are you going to put it in, a, in the, the text editor thing that they have? Um, the note, the note section they have on, on the computer system? Um, or are you going to highlight? Because you can highlight with a whole bunch of different colors. And all of that is part of what I call your strategy for the exam. So I recommend when you're doing these, these practice like it's the real deal, 
truly have your strategy figured out um, so that you're testing that strategy in that ex that situation as well. Just to harp on that. Because I personally think it's probably like 80-20%, you know, the classic 80-20 rule in networking. But I kind of think it's 80% knowledge and experience and the 20% is actually on the technique that Zig mentions. It's it's exactly that. It's knowing how you're going to cope with that exam, how you're going to deal with it, how you're going to make those notes, how you're going to reference those notes, you know, whether they relate to security or just mm -hmm. infrastructure, et cetera. It's, so a lot of this is the exam itself. And that's the kind of thing that you read in these books is the technology and the technique as well to help you. Yeah, you can learn the technology. And, and our books are going to help you with that. Our combined books are going to help you learn the technology if you don't know the technologies. And you're going to be able to compare, you know, the different technologies together. Um, but really what those books, what you need to do is is do this and, and figure out where your weak points are in your strategy. I mean, that's honestly the key to success. The other thing I would call out is as you're going through um, the exam and you're answering questions, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, answer the one that you can best defend the why, right? And that's a tagline I've been saying for a long time, be able to defend the why, answer it. But once you answer that question, you're done with that question. Don't let whatever happens next make you feel like, oh, I got it wrong or I did something wrong. No, you answered that question to the best of your ability. And again, I have a hypothetical, you know, question like EIGRP, OSPF are the right answers, BGP and RIP are the wrong answers. But if you picked EIGRP or you picked OSPF, stick with it, move on. You might get a level set email or, or some sort of exhibit that says, maybe you picked OSPF as the right answer. And it comes back and says, well, we went with EIGRP, right? That doesn't mean you got that question wrong. Doesn't mean you got it right, but doesn't mean you got it wrong. So you got, you're going to be put in a different situation where you have to design something else uh, in that exam. And I, I, I think I did that okay, Mark, right? By how I said that, that doesn't violate anything, right? Nope. I'm not come after you for that one. All right. All right. Good. Yeah, See, I'm thing. trying, I'm teeing that line, guys. I'm trying to help you as much as I can. All right. So we have the big red uh, mute zig button ready. Uh, uh, on standby in case you get too close to exam NDA. So <laughs> it's all hypothetical questions, right? But the point is it's strategy, right? And don't let things happen in the exam affect your strategy. Thank yes. you. Thank you. That is a very good advice. Um, for many folks jumping right to the expert level, exam for design might be, um, you know, a bit of a, uh, a large mountain to climb. Um, and so the question came up around professional level design uh, certification options. Um, would anyone like to speak to the options that are available there? Yes. So as you might know, we a couple of years ago, we had the CCDA and CCDP as well. Um, so the design associate and design professional, these got end of life a couple of years ago as well. Um, so now there's a CCMP design exam. I can't remember the exam code. To be honest, it's I think it's ENSLD. So it's designing Cisco Enterprise Networks. This is kind of like a professional level design exam. It's not going to give you a full certification like the CCDP would have done but it gives you a, a, a solid foundation of design knowledge and how to think with the right mindset. Uh, it's not gonna bring you close to be able to pass the, the CCD because for the D you also need the practical experience, but it's a very good start if you're completely new to design and you want to start with a design, that could be a good place to start. Um, and it was at the ENSLD Designing Cisco Enterprise Networks. That would probably be a good place to to start if if you want to look at something at the professional level. Yeah, and it does award the specialist certification for right. um, yep for the corresponding exam too. So um, while it's not not quite a full CCMP or CCDE, of course, um, it, it is a very uh, valid uh, specialist certification as well that's awarded there. But isn't it isn't it a concentration exam? Like, doesn't it help you if you don't have your CCMP? So you could take like one of the CCMP exams and then take that as your concentration, and now you get your CCMP if you don't have it. Yep, that's exactly right. Exactly, exactly right. Standalone, it's a specialist cert. Um, but if you combine it with one of the other certifications and exams in the uh, enterprise 
networking track. It'll help you to earn the CCMP as well. Also, you can earn uh, help you to recertify any uh, lower level exams or certifications too. Awesome. And, and 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 isn't there a Cisco Press book on that? I think there is. There's a Cisco Press book on that one too. That I couldn't. I don't. I couldn't speak to off the top of my head personally, but um, most likely, yeah. Yeah. So I think there is. Uh, uh... So Nancy's on the call, or she's sending me messages. So there's also a CCMP Enterprise Design ENSLD 300-420 Official Certification Guide. So if anyone's looking to go after that, that book is out there as well um, that you can get and, and study up and, and you know take the exam. Perfect. Thank you, Zig. Um, okay, so uh, and then also staying just a little bit um, in depth with some of the exam topics. Um, there's a question from Michael that wanted to get a little clarification in terms of the um, practical exam context. If you could clarify what is meant between, um, so how many years does the term long term or short term equal? Michael's understanding was short term refers to up to five years and long term would refer to more than five years. Um, would you mind speaking to that? Assuming the question makes sense. Makes sense to me, but Mark, is there an official it's kind of Cisco? I thought it was around, we've heard five to seven years and we've heard seven to 10 years. But... Again, it's, it's, it's only, a, it's, it's not per se a strict requirement to be five to seven years. This is just the, the average of what you typically would learn and know enough to be able to, to make a meaningful attempt at the CCD. Personally, to, to speak to that, prior to, to ending up taking over the CCD, CCD program, when I took the exam myself, I had three to four years of, of relevant experience job. So it, it depends on who you are. It depends on how you think. If you're if you're able to, to make the mindset change from the IE world or from the operational and deployment world, then it's easier for you than someone who who's has struggled a bit with, with making that mind, mindset uh, change or shift. Um, so the five to seven is just a guidance. It's nothing more than that. Um, I would say if you if you do this on a regular basis, if you do designing networks for customers or for your organization, and you do it daily and you've done it for two or three years, chances are you could you could be ready for the exam. You just don't know it yet. Um, but there's no, it, 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 it's, it all comes down to, do you feel ready yourself? That's what it is. Um, so I, that's great. I, I think the question also, I, I think it was about short term and long term on the exam. Um, and, and when you see that text, like find, maybe, and maybe they can put something in, in the question or in, in the chat. I think it was around, you know, identifying a short term option for a design situation and then identifying a long term option and what does short term mean and what does long term mean in that context of that scenario or that question i think that's the question that's being asked um and, and i don't know if there's an official statement mark on that um my view always was you know short term is kind of like a band-aid like you needed there's a there's a requirement in the scenario that means you have to do something now um, and then there might be a longer term, better solution because the short term may not be the best design, right? But again, it's all based on the scenario in the business. So I'll give it a hypothetical, like uh, daisy chaining axis switches, right? Real easy, right? Just putting a whole bunch of axis switches in a line, uh, no real design, but there may be a requirement that says you need to do that right now to give us access to other users in this other location for whatever reason. But the long-term solution might be, let's do a distribution layer and let's do an access layer. Let's do a layer three access design. So th that's how I take it. I don't know if it's set necessarily on a time frame, but short-term is something we have to do pretty, pretty quickly because there's a requirement. And then long-term is the better option that we have to do eventually. Yeah, I just call it a tactical fix, short-term. But yeah, I think you nailed that one, yeah. That's great, Martin. Yeah, that's great. And, and again, it's, it's going to be clear in the scenario in the the practical exam whether it's you're looking for a short term or a long term. Um, but again, as with anything else, be prepared. You might need to need to be prepared for justifying or defending that position of why is this short term a good solution here and now, and how can we fix them on long term? It doesn't mean that you'll have both questions in in a scenario. 
but you could have one that asks for a short-term fix and then, okay, how can we do this on a, on a long-term? It all depends on the scenario, but it's good to know your options in both short-term and, and long-terms and analyze your way towards that, that specific um, answer depending on, on the scenario that you get. Just a brief follow-up for myself. Would that factor into the questions around and considerations around CapEx versus OpEx as well, the lifespan of solutions? That could be one of the, the let's say that the, the, the reasons for doing a certain thing is that, well, we need to do something now, but we don't have any money to do it. So you have no CapEx or sorry, you have no, um, you have got no, no CapEx to do it by any hardware. So you need to do something with what you have at the moment. So that could be leading to something that you can do by implementing some changes to the network or making some design changes to the network. Whereas if you need to do a full-term, long-term solutions, you might need to invest in new hardware, invest in new platform technologies, whatever it might be. And that would be a limiting factor based on, we don't have any money available for CapEx. Uh, we might be able to give you $5 for OPEX a month, um, but we don't, if you have anything else. And then again, that's gonna be part of the scenario you'll be knowing if, if you have money available. It doesn't need that it has to be a specific amount, but money's available or money's not available. Those are the kind of things that you can look for to figure out, okay, what can I do based on what I have today? I think you need, you need to remember there's all gonna be very, very real world. You're not gonna get in some wacky financial situation here. It's gonna be kind of things that you'd see on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not, we don't expect you to be able to calculate advanced stuff and things like that. We, we, we still want to do this the technical way. This is still a technical exam, but you need to understand what CAPE is, what OPEX objects is and how they relate to each other. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, looking at the clock, we'll keep uh, moving and then we'll have to start to move towards wrapping up the verbal Q and A portion here. Um, shortly, but we can keep the uh, written Q and A open for a bit after the after we close down the the main session as well to try to tackle additional questions in in written form. Um, but we'll try to get to a couple more here. Um, hey, Matt, can I jump in real quick? I'm sorry, I yes, just absolutely please. So everyone on, on the screen that you're seeing, you're seeing that the discount code expires January 31st, which is like a week or two from now. Um, and obviously my book's not out yet. So I just talked to the Cisco press um, side of things and they're gonna either extend that that deadline so you can use it for my book when it's published um, or they're gonna create a new one when that happens. So just so I know there were some questions on that. Uh, I did reply to a few of you, but just so you have that information that you know that discount code, it says it expires. They're gonna either extend it or they're gonna add a new one. Thank you so much, Zig. And I can work on coordinating with the team uh, prior to sending out follow-up email comms whether we do a new code or we just extend that date as well. Thank you, Zig, and thank you for catching that there. Um, okay, um, lab, I'm sorry, exam kind of um, environment and, and, and scenario. A couple questions. Um, access to Cisco documentation during the lab exam. Yes. Easily can answer that with a yes. You have access to the Cisco documentation and the Cisco CVD zone. So yeah, if you need to look something up, you can do it. Um, but you better know exactly where to find it because otherwise you'll be probably be in a time issue if you need to search for it first. But it is available, yes. Perfect, thank you so much. And then Zig, there was a question from Christian that came in about um, you know, English reading speed. And how important is that in your experience for both you and Martin? You know, um, basically the question is, what about English reading speed? How important is this? Martin Zig, was this different in your past attempt? Finished early because you felt comfortable with all of the answers? Difference against your failed attempts? So, you know, was speed of understanding the questions just based on language skills, right? Around, you know, the English language skills. Um, do you feel that was some, do you feel that played a factor into when you passed eventually? Were you kind of just more comfortable and used to answering the questions? Can you kind of speak to that a bit? Let's see, yeah, real quick. Um, so it, it, there, there were some, so I, I took the exam four times, right? And I know that, that I told you at the beginning, the three times I failed, 
I had different different issues, um, and, and of course we can go into detail on that in the, in the, in the um the forum when we open up the forum too but the intent is that one time i think i spent 20 minutes reading the scenario one time i spent 60 minutes reading scenarios and then it hurt me the entire exam because i spent way too much time now i'm i, I can read english i'm a native english speaker so it's not hard for me to read it. it but it wasn't reading that was the issue for me it was pulling out the key information and then keeping it either top of mind the whole exam the whole scenario or putting it down somewhere so I could easily find it or easily, you know, pick it back up when I'm answering a question that's related to that requirement or that constraint. Um, so, you know, I, I harped on strategy earlier. Um, something that I did, it may not help you, but I created a table of contents, um, little, little list uh, on the, the paper I got. And I put, you know, QoS information is on document one. So D1 is document one and QoS information, QoS. So that I don't have to memorize where it is. I would just go back and be like, oh, the QoS requirement is on document one and I have a QoS question. Um, or, you know, it could be OPEX or a business, a business thing is on document three. And I just kept doing that. And that's how I, it helped me. You still have to read the, the scenario, right? You still have to understand the scenario, but you need to find a way to be effective and efficient on your time. I hope that answered the question, Christian. And maybe Martin has another, another viewpoint or perspective. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You I mean you had a slightly different way of doing it than I did. I, I would just mark out different, use different color codes for different requirements and you know different areas. You know, security, layer two, layer three, etc. So I, when I scan those documents, I, it would just stand out, and I could just look at that because you do spend so much time going through that information. You know, the the, the countdown time is ticking away, and you, isn't that that part's not nice? But generally, there isn't a real time constraint as long as you've got your strategy sorted out as long as you've read that background information that should take about 15 minutes on average then yeah knowing where to look is the most important thing and you can just go back to it but you've really got to absorb that scenario and, and you know everyone says connect with the scenario and unless you've read that information and you absorb it you're never going to connect with it and it's just going to be a, a bit of a mess so do do spend some time and but the practice scenarios that's what they're there for you, you you'll grow from each one that you take just add a quick note to that. I've seen there's been a couple of questions about the the how it is to as a non-native English speaker to take the exam. I'll take a, add a few words to that. The exam is written with as basic English as we can get away with. We're not going to use overly complex sentences. Um, we're not going to use strange words that you only use two times in your life. We'll use common English terms. Of course, there's some technical terms you need to know that are specialized within whatever area that you're looking at. But in general, what we, we strive to do and what is the official Cisco learning uh, policy is to use what is equivalent to seventh grade English. Um, and we'll, we'll, it, everything goes under a strict grammar review and also language review. So we, we have word and language editors that helps us make sure it's not too complex. So even though you're not a non-native English speaker, you should be good because when, when, when you would build the scenarios, we t try to take this into account. So when Martin say 15 minutes in average, that's a good starting point. Some people might only spend 10, some might spend 20 because they are slow to, slow to read. And there's time for both. Um, so you should be fine even though you're not a native English speaker. You should be fine as long as you like keep you have your strategy planned out so you don't need to think about the strategy as you go along. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. Um, I think that just keeping an eye on the clock, we should probably go ahead and start to wrap up the audio portion of the session. Um, we can move uh, into our kind of back, you know, back in uh, practice mode within WebEx here and still tackle a few of the questions that as you as you guys have some time. Um, however, for everyone who's still on the call, if you have an unanswered question and we're not able to get to it uh, be before we run out of time after the session as well, uh, two things. I did share a link in the chat to an open forum thread in the CCDE community forum space on the Cisco Learning Network. Um, so please feel free to move your question into that, that open discussion thread. Um, and you'll also be redirected to that discussion forum um, as you exit the session today. So you should be able to 
quickly jump in and post your question again, and we can follow up kind of offline as well further. Um, as well as the recording information will be sent along to all of the attendees, as well as the Cisco Press discount code information. I'll make sure to square away the expiration dates before we send that off. But all of that information will be sent along after the session today. So I think primarily at this point, I want to thank everybody for attending the session. Um, it's really important that you made time to join us, so that's extremely appreciated. And of course, Martin and Zig and Mark, thank you all so much for uh, sharing your experience and your wisdom and your guidance with us all today. And um, other than some, some closing words from the three of you, if you would like, we'll go ahead and wrap up the audio portion. And once again, just thank everybody for joining the call and hope that you found it valuable and useful. And let's definitely keep the um, communication and the chat going in the discussion forum as well offline. Um, gentlemen, any closing, any closing thoughts or words from your end? I can um, say, oh. if, if I could just say quickly, again, thank you for, for joining. What you can do is always reach out to me. Feel free to reach out, find me on LinkedIn or social media in general. Reach out to me, post your questions in the CCD community and learning uh, network. I'll be, I'm there frequently to see if there's anything I need to, to look at. So post a question there, I'll be sure to answer it. And I'm sure we'll have Zig and Martin circling around the next couple of days as well to, to help and answer any questions that might pop up in there. I was just gonna say thanks Matt and Mark for arranging it and Zig for helping. And uh, just say to everyone, thanks for all the questions. And you know, it, it's a very tough exam, but it is very achievable and it's very worthwhile. So I definitely recommend that you, you give it a go. You'll grow from it. Thank, Thank you all for joining today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I think this was great. Hopefully you can see the passion that we have for this exam and the certification as a whole. Um, we are very passionate about it. Uh, and we're really a tight knit community. So ask your questions. I know today was live and whatnot, but ask them on the forum that, that Matt posted. Just reach out to us. We're happy to help. That's what we're here to do. So thank you all very much. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much all. Uh